because you need to find the, the sentence that finish with a question mark. Okay, sometimes it's very explicit, but sometimes the authors simply say, uh, in this paper want to investigate, so this is the main question. And it's important to realize that when the authors verbalize, they write the sentence in this way, uh, they may not include the question mark, but it's not a hypothesis, okay? The hypothesis is, be, is, is has the structure of an argument, and in this case, the objective, objective of this study is to investigate whatever. This is not a hypothesis. This is a question without a question mark, okay? Um, Okay. The study present, presents two hypotheses. What are these two hypotheses? Very easy, okay, in this case. Spiders would pref prefer to build their webs on new leaves, and spiders would prefer to build their webs closer to extra floral nectars, okay? Now, perhaps we can discuss your question. Uh, why do you think that these two hypotheses are not related to the question? Uh, I don't know if it is this main question that it's written in the slide, but there was a part in the introduction, in like the very end, that it says the objective of this work was to investigate whether while building spiders select foraging sites in branches of T. pernambus cancers. And it shouldn't be whether it chooses, whether it selects, maybe where it selects. You know, the objective is what you see, where it selects the foreign sites in the plants with extrafloral nectaries. I don't know, I thought that this phrasing in this part was a little bit broad, mm -hmm. and maybe perhaps didn't connect with the hypothesis. Okay. I understand what you said in, in the very last part of this class today. We will talk about hypothesis, disguised, disguised, I don't know how to say, fantasiadas of hypothesis, or, or, of uh, questions, uh, sorry, <laughs> hypothesis disguised as, as questions, okay? And I think this, this part of the class responds very well uh, what you are saying. So depending on the way your hypothesis is written and depending on the way your question is written, uh, you m perhaps may confuse the, the writers. I really don't think that this is the case here, okay? And we can come back to the subject at the end of the class, okay? But here, the authors do have a question, okay? and they have two very clear hypotheses, and these two hypotheses, they are complementary or they are mutually excluded? Okay. This may be true and be, this may not. This may be true and the other one may not, and both can be true and both can, cannot be true, okay? So one thing that we discussed was that like, are they really independent because the extra floral nectaries really exist on newer leaves? They are not present in the older leaves. Yeah, it, so it, it might sense, be the it's, case. It's like, yeah. uh, this is something that we discussed, right? Because there, it, it also will play later on how we structure the premises because in a sense there is, uh, the, the, these hypotheses are not exactly independent, right? Like uh, uh, the codependence means that confirming one of them would indirectly also corroborate the other. Okay, I fully agree with this statement, but it's very important to see that when they, I, I don't know if they, I, do you have the materials and methods here or only the introduction? Okay, uh, today we are going to see the materials and methods of this paper. And what happens when we see the average and the standard deviation of, uh, of the new leaves, which means that the number of leaves showing uh, active extrafloral nectars, it ranges from three until 12. So 
they decided to call new leaves uh, only one, uh, only the eight first leaves of, of a branch. So you may have some leaves that they call new, that are in fact old, and some leaves that they are old and they are calling new uh, and vice versa. So it might be the case that in nature you find no pattern related to new leaves and old leaves, but you have a pattern of uh, finding uh, plants close to extrafloral nectars. Moreover, as you go, perhaps we are going, we are not studying the discussion. In this case, spiders may select the extrafloral ne uh, nectar region, and this selection is not related to the presence of nectaries. The, the leaf is more or less like a hat or a Japanese or Chinese hat. And spiders may build their webs here just because this region is more protected from rain. So it's very nice because they do not prefer new leaves, but they, they are always close to the nectaries. And in this case, it means that probably the reason because they are there is not the, ne the, uh, the nectar nectaries. So they are connected but not necessarily one of them depends on the other. And of course, I presented here a lot of information you didn't have a, a access. So what you thought is completely right and fair, okay? Are these hypotheses constructed as logic arguments? You, you can find problems in the argument, okay? And I think 100% of the time I find problems. But is it an argument? Okay, I'm gonna show you this argument, okay? And we can discuss if they are good, if they are bad, and what is missing, perhaps. Yes, there are pre pre premise logically connected. Okay, hypothesis one. Here, I'm going to present the pre premise. Mm -hmm. Here, the sentence. And then I will give my own answer if this premise is a fact or an assumption. OK? So the first one is young leaves are more palatable. It's, they are easy to feed or to eat. And to herbivores in general. OK? Is it a fact or is it an assumption? Assumption. Because why can I say that this is an assumption? In general. Assuming that. Assuming. Oh, so this is very nice thing, because sometimes the authors are very nice, and they say something to show to the readers that this is an assumption. Sometimes they, are, they use other words or other expressions that are clearly related to facts. One of them, given that, given that, is, I, I know this, okay? Uh, maybe if the author says something that, is, that doesn't have a citation, that is something that it, it created yeah. for Okay. His argument, I, I can consider that is an assumption and every time that you have a citation is a fact or not? Yeah, th thank you very much. This is a very important question. Uh, in many cases, when authors include a, a, a citation, they are talking about facts. The problem is most of people don't know how to cite. And what they do? They, to reinforce their assumption, they cite a paper, OK? And I need to find the, the chalk here. Natalia, o outro que não vai me matar, onde está? Ah, esse aqui. Ah, é aqui. Pode limpar para mim, por favor? Ah, claro. No, no, it's here. Okay, ah. thank you. And 
In this case, young leaves are more palatable than uh, to our herbivore in general. Some people could say, Okay, and this is weird because they start the sentence saying, assuming, so I'm not sure about that. So what does this reference mean? Yes, we don't have any precise information for the species I am studying, but this guy perhaps conducted a, a review showing that young leaves in general are more palatable, okay? I don't like it. And there are at least two different w uh, ways of showing to your reads that this is not the case and why this reference is being used. The first one is reviewing Thompson. So this is a review. It's not related to my own paper. And if you have more information about the, oh, it's not working. Okay. And if you have more information about how young leaves are more palatable than old leaves, perhaps you can find some here, or I'm sure that you can find some information here. And other way to cite this, and is an, uh, a way that I think is very interesting, and I use this all the time is, This means, for example. So what does it mean? <laughs> uh, young leaves are more palatable than in, uh, to herbivores in general. And for instance, see this guy. So I am providing a reference that supports my statement, but this statement is not related to my, the species I am studying, okay? So these are two ways of support the citation, okay? Uh, but it's still remaining as an assumption. Okay now? Perfect. The second premise is young leaves have active extrafloral nectaries that attract ants. Is it a fact or an assumption? Okay, I will not discuss this, it is obvious. Uh, I found, or I would like to include another premise. Prey availability is higher in young leaves. But c could you find this? Or it's not in the text. Yeah. But can you think that th th this is important to include as in a premise? Yeah. Why? <laughs> yeah, if it's not true, the argument has a gap, okay? So is it a fact or is it an assumption? It might be a fact if they provide a reference for this species. And it will be an assumption if it's, okay, I am based this, based this premise in the work of other guys, not in the species I am studying now, okay? Since they did not include this premise, I don't know, okay? I think this premise is important, but once the, the, the text doesn't show uh, this premise, it, it can be both. Wouldn't this be like a deduction? from the facts and assumptions prior? Sorry? This? <laughs> Wouldn't this be a deduction from the prior premises? Like, young leaves are more parable to herbivores in general. Herbivores are the preys we are looking at, so they are going to be close to the leaves 
and therefore they are going to be more available since they are because I mean assuming that uh, eating is a local process they are they are going to have be around the leaves to, to be I don't think so and we <laughs> went through that point yes they thank you for helping me <laughs> because uh, uh, you may you may have another another source of, of nutrients in the plant, which are not leaves, for example, uh, perhaps their roots are attacked or are attacked or, or the, the stems. It's not, I don't know if it is uh, uh, really uh, feasible or plausible, but then uh, you could have somewhere else in the plant where there are more uh, prey availability, even if the young leaves are more palatable compared to the old leaves. Because then you're only comparing leaves. It isn't saying that uh, in all of the plant, uh, young leaves are, are And I, I can add a, a very uh, simple uh, way of showing that this is not necessarily uh, an, an obvious conclusion based on the true premise. The first premise, show that young leaves will have uh, are more palatable it does not mean necessarily that the fact that is palatable would attract more herbivores but the effect of young leaves is positive on their herbivores okay the second one says that young leaves attracts more ants and this effect is negative to herbivores which one is, is more uh, important. If the first one is more important than the second one, so the third premise is obvious. If the second one is more important, the th third one is not obvious at all. Yeah, but I would, <coughs> I would agree with Benjamin because, okay, it, it can't, maybe it cannot be obvious, but as the, the third premise is not written, it's basically basically a deduction that we are making, you know, because it is it isn't here. It's not written, so we are deduction this based in the whole text. But sure. it remains a deduction. Mm -hmm. It remains something that you need to think and I'll say, oh, okay, so this is this. I would like to think that the authors follow the same irrationality. So they thought, okay, this is more or less obvious, and I don't want to to say it clearly in, in the text. So, so I, I think everyone here is somehow right. And we, uh, I think that it might be obvious. And I, as a writer, I would like to say, even if, if it is obvious, just to be sure that this assumption is clear to my, my readers, okay? Uh, I really like to make my hypothesis very, very well supported because sometimes you can find an angry review, reviewer and the lack of an assumption may be used to somehow destroy your work, okay? And it happens all the time. So the conclusion is spiders would prefer to build their own uh, webs on new leaves. Here is a conclusion, so there it's, it's not a fact or an assumption. It's the conclusion of the argument, okay? The second one, so now, sorry. So the, the first hypothesis, we have a rule, we have a cause, and we are trying to infer the, the effect. The rule is the spiders build their webs in places with high prey av availability. The causes, herbivores and ants are more abundant in new leaves, and thus spiders would prefer to build their webs preferentially in, in new leaves. This is the logic. The second hypothesis has the first premise, extra floral nectaries know, uh, are known to attract potential prey, such as ants. Fact or assumption? It depends on citation, I guess. Is there a citation? I don't remember. <laughs> it does? Okay, so it's a fact. 
Let's assume that this citation is related to the species they are studying, okay? If it's not, it would be an assumption. But, but based on the way the paper is cited, our hypothesis is that, a, is that there is a fact. Okay, premise. Ants are more abundant and predictable close to extrafloral nectars. Is it written? Okay, I think this is another important premise that was not clearly stated. And uh, I think it's a fact if we uh, assume that they have the information here. But it could be an assumption. Okay. The conclusion is spiders would prefer uh, to build their webs closer to extrafloral nectaries. Okay, conclusion. I think this uh, can summarize this hypothesis. We have a rule. Spiders build their webs in places with high prey availability. Ants are more abundant and predictable, closer to uh, extrafloral nectaries. So spiders would build their webs prefer preferentially closer to uh, extrafloral nectaries. OK. So message four. Your study may have two or more hypotheses. We can be complementary or competing, all right? Let's talk a little bit about this. This guy here with this amazing beard is Dr. Thomas Chamberlain, a geologist. And 18, in 1885, he published this uh, paper the method of multiple working hypotheses and the subtitle I love it with this method the dangers of parental affection for a favorite theory can be circumvented <laughs> and Alejandro Farge Brenne the author I have already mentioned many times before uh, he called uh, he grabbed this sentence and this work and created a nickname and he calls it I don't know how to say in, in English sorry hipótese de pelúcia <laughs> so you love it you you embrace it you you don't want to kill your hypothesis okay and one of the last words of this this paper that has been republished in 1965 in science is I believe that one of the highest, the greatest moral reforms that lies immediately before us consists in the general introduction into, into social and civic life of that ha habit of mental procedure which is known in investigation at, at met, as the method of multiple hypotheses. And note that he's not talking about science, okay? He's talking about moral and civic uh, actions. So in current days, imagine, it would be wonderful if people are thinking about multiple hypotheses to perhaps solve important questions in the field of politics, for instance. Nowadays, we don't have even a single hypothesis. We have only opinions. Imagine people working different hypotheses. Okay, it's a dream. Okay, this is very important, the, the suggestion by Chamberlain, because it's well known that our brain is highly uh, susceptible to confirmation bias. So uh, we like an idea and we look for any kind of evidence that confir confirm this uh, prejudice. And we usually forget or do not the patient in any kind of evidence that uh, does not support our prejudice. So when we have multiple hypotheses, uh, it's, it's very difficult to love all of them so you are spreading your love and you don't have any problem to kill some of your loves uh, while you are conducting your study. 
this, uh, you, you can say, okay, this, this subject is old, but in 2017, very, uh, a very recent paper, these guys, the first author is uh, from Brazil, although he's working in, in Canada. And the title of the paper is Why Are We Not Evaluating Multiple Competing Hypotheses in Ecology and Evolution? So the subject is very new, remains as very new. And they provide this very nice graphic. They collected information from these uh, journals, ecology, ecology letters, molecular ecology, evolution in global change, uh, biology, all of them high profile journals. And here the darker gray includes all studies, the light gray uh, more than one hypothesis, multiple hypotheses, and the white one single exhaustive hypothesis, single hypothesis. And what you can see here, the first pattern, which is amazing, is that the all articles and this multiple and single hypothesis. If you put this bar on this bar, we had studies that had some kind of hypothesis, okay? Multiples, multiple or just one. When we compare this bar on this bar with the, this bar, what is the conclusion? Most of the studies? What the hell? Yes. And they also divide the papers in papers focused on theory, on descriptions of pa uh, patterns or application of, uh, of knowledge. And this pattern is the same regardless of the subject. So it's amazing to me that most of the studies don't have hypotheses, and when they have, it's surprising that they have multiple hypotheses. The only area that is not using this approach is application. Okay, <laughs> so, but only one question. Uh, when you say that the study has no hypothesis, is that like in the introduction it has no hypothesis or like in the whole study it has no hypothesis even before the... In the whole study. The whole there study. There is no hypothesis. Even after the conclusion and all. Sorry. So, uh, <laughs> this is another important thing. I don't know if I'm going to... Uh, talk about this in this course, but I always talk in my course on scientific writings, there are two types of hypotheses. One of them is a priori hypothesis. And a priori hypothesis is the, the hypothesis that you are working in, want, you want to, to, to test. Okay. And if your hypothesis is not supo supported uh, by your data, people are expecting that you propose an explanation for the lack of uh, support. In this case, it's very common to see in the discussion what we call a posteriori hypothesis. So I invented or I'm proposing this hypothesis based on my own results, and this is a possible explanation. This is not the case we are talking here. Here is a priori hypothesis. And why they are, are they not considering a, uh, a posteriori hypothesis? Because all a posteriori hypothesis can explain your data. They were created to explain your data. So I have a friend that say, predict the past is a, uh, it's a perfect science. You, you, you are always able to predict the past here. A lot, a lot. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> I like it because <laughs> uh, I think tapping is kind yes. of uh, uh, how do but how do you evaluate from reading a paper that the hypothesis was really done prior to to all of the experiment and the lab because uh, you can I, I imagine you can uh, not in mathematics but in biology that you can somehow uh, 
kind of falsify that you already had thought of that before conducting the experiment and 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 just present the the text in such a way that it makes it seem like the uh, so you propose your hypothesis after you had already your data yes yeah, uh, no because you you said uh, one of your friends always says that oh if you if you uh, come up with a with hypothesis after doing after having all the data. Your hypothesis you, will be always supported. Yes, it will be always supported. So how do you, for example, when you're an editor or when you're reading a paper, how do you how do you see that uh, this is not just a a makeup text which makes uh, events uh, be in the order that would be most like most likable most uh, I don't know. I understood. This is an amazing question. And as a reviewer or as an editor, uh, I think I have a lot of experience. And what I can say, it's, it's very, very hard to detect this kind of fraud. And this is a fraud, OK? Perhaps um, not a big one, but it, it is a fraud. Our knowledge, it's not advancing if you are predicting hypothesis after you already have your, your, your own data, OK? And sometimes, I think, according to my own exper experience, there are two ways of detecting this uh, type of fraud. The first one is there is a very well-established theory uh, in the literature. And the person is, does not base uh, the hypothesis on this well-established theory. So the authors start to build a completely different story and come up with a completely new hypothesis. Sometimes it might be the case that they are trying to, to promote a break on true, a scientific break on true. But you see that the, the paragraphs are not well connected, in, in, you see that there is something strange there. And th the second one is, in general, this kind of fraud is performed by people that have not so much experience in, in scientific method or how to write a paper. And you see that the connection between the ideas uh, are not well, they, they are not well supported. And they reach a hypothesis that you, I can't understand why they are proposing this. And when you see the results, you understand, okay, they are just trying to figure out uh, or to state in the introduction um, the results they, they found. So it, it's very hard. But I know some big shot guys, they, they, they do that all the time. But they are very good at writing, very good. And in this case, it's very hard to detect the fraud. Uh, a quick anecdote. Once we decided to test a very famous hypothesis that has never been tested before, have never been tested before. And we went to the field, collect the data, and we found exactly the opposite pattern. So the, the hypothesis, males taking care of the offspring should die, with, uh, uh, would, would show a higher mortality because they are stopped and hardly predictable in, state, in space and time. And we found that males taking care of the offspring have a much higher survi survival rates when compared with males that are not caring for the offspring and they are wandering ar around. We wrote the paper, submitted to a, a, a very nice uh, journal, and one of the, the reviewers said, wow, your results are amazing. Why don't you change your hypothesis? <laughs> and, and, and this person signed the review, and I didn't know her. And, uh, who is this person? And I went to see. She was uh, the student, a PhD student of a really, really big shot guy. And two weeks uh, later, I found her in a congress. 
Ah, oh, you revised our paper, thank you very much. But we are not really compelled to, to make the change about the hypothesis. And she said, oh, don't worry, my advisor do, does this all the time. <laughs> so she learned to, to do that. <laughs> okay. Now, this is the most amazing part of, of the, the talk, of the class. We are going to talk about predictions. And, well, I, I don't know if you read, but the text, the, the, the paper I sent to you before the, 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 the class was focusing on how to make the difference between hypotheses and predictions. And I'm following the same uh, rationale uh, presented in, in, in this, this paper. So the only way to test a hypothesis is by determining the expected results that should be happen if that hypothesis were correct. And the expected results of hypothesis are known as predictions. So, as I told you yesterday, once you have a hypothesis, you can figure out your expected results, and these expected results are known as predictions. While hypotheses cannot be measured directly because they do not have units, we don't know how to measure because they, this hypothesis use uh, a different type of variables that we, I'm going to introduce you in the next slide. Predictions are directly quantifiable and is stated in the variables that we can measure. We can transform predictions on data that will be used in the paper in, the, in your study. So now I'm going to introduce you the two types of variables. And here, I'm not talking about predictor variable and responsive variable. This is, sta is statistics, okay? I'm talking about two types of, of variables that we use when we are talking about hypotheses and predictions. The first type of variable is what we call theoretical variable. And these variable, uh, the, the theoretical variables, they represent the phenomena we want to study. This is an idea. This is not concrete. I'm going to show you examples. And the second kind of variable is the operational variable. And this kind of variable represents, uh, or they are real measures. We, we, we want to obtain in our study. So this is the kind of variable that we can go to the field, to the laboratory, and obtain based on a given protocol. Okay, let's exercise this idea. Here we have the world of ideas, our theoretical variables. And here we have l real life, where are the operational variables, okay? So let's start with this variable, theoretical variable. And I can say, what's your size? <laughs> My size? Yeah. <laughs> like oh, one meter and six feet. All right. Yes. What's your size? Theoretical or operational? <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Which one? If I say theoretical. Uh, I don't know. Uh, medium. Medium? Yeah. No, you, you don't say theoretical. Uh, my size in terms of theoretical variables, it doesn't make any sense because I can, I can measure it. Yeah. My size is my size. It's an idea. Okay. But in terms of real life, what's your size? Real life, uh, 1.65. Okay. What's your size? 1.7. Is this the only way to measure size? No. Please give me another example. Shoe size. Shoe size. Shoe size. Shoe size. 
Imagine that I, I am uh, a guy that works with shoes. So when you come to my uh, uh, I, I forgot the, the word, oh my God, my lodger, I forgot, <laughs> store. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't think I will evaluate you by your head. I'm going to look at your feet immediately to have an idea what the size of shoe I will offer to you. Okay, if you are a tailor. Exactly. They, they, especially men, they look at the, 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 this kind of measure. I don't know the name in, in English. In, in Portuguese, we say cintura uh, escapular. This is the name. Uh, and if you are a UFC fighter, your muscles, your weight. Your weight. The categories in any kind of fight, they are based on weight. I will not put you to fight with a, a sumo uh, fighter. It doesn't make any sense. It's a not fair uh, fight, unless you are a, a, a jiu-jitsu expert. Then you will anyone. So size, examples, height, you said height. But look, this is a operational variable, OK? Dry mass, you use the dry mass for plants, for instance, diameter at the breast rate, uh, 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 height. We use this to measure the size of uh, trees. It's very high, hard to, to measure the height of, uh, of a tree. So we use this diameter at the breast rate. You can use body mass, and we can use a lot of different measures, OK? And what's the best one? Depends your, on your fucking question. <laughs> oh, oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Fecundity. Number of offspring, number of eggs, number of cities. OK, whatever. Locomotor performance. Velocity. Huh? Distance uh, run in whatever time. OK, maximum speed, sprint speed, mean velocity, and I say a lot of them. The most important message here, these things you cannot measure. These things live inside our head. They are theoretical. All these things we can measure, and these things live in the real life. The, they are operational variable. OK? This is amazing. OK. We can return to our marvelous example of the seedlings of plant A uh, growing under or far a plant of, uh, of a, a shrub of plant B. OK? We all know our experts on, on this system. And we have two hypotheses. One of them is the facilitation hypothesis. And according to the hypothesis, please note the hypothesis lives inside our head. So hypotheses are written only using theoretical variables. So seedlings of plant B, B A will perform better when, uh, when they are protected from intense si sunlight. And now we can have predictions. One prediction of the facilitation hypothesis, if I'm measuring growth rate as uh, centimeters per month, what is the prediction if you are considering the facilitation hypothesis? The growth rate will be high, low? OK. What would be the prediction about the mortality, the percent, percentage of dead seedlings after one year? OK. So higher under, under plant B and lower under plant B. 
And why can I predict this? Because I have precise and measurable variables here. Okay? So I translated a theoretical idea into things, things that I can measure in the field. Okay? And this is very important. The other hypothesis we have is the competition hypothesis. And according to the, this hypothesis, seedlings of plant A will perform worse when they are near a larger com competitor. So now using exactly the same pre uh, operational variables, we can now make predictions. What will be the prediction about growth rate when we consider the competition hypothesis? Lower under plant B. Okay. And what's the prediction, uh, prediction for the other variable? Higher. Remember, I told you, these hypotheses are mutually excluded. And now we can see this very clear when we compare the predictions. Here is high, here is lower. Here is lower, here is higher. So it's very obvious now. If I found support for one hypothesis, the other one cannot be true. Please. Oh. Just to see that I understood, uh, here my theoretical variable would be the performance of the plant. Sorry. Just to see that I understand here my theoretical variable, it's the performance of the plant, that's the idea. Perform. The, the first, uh, the first uh, theoretical variable uh -huh. is... Uh, the, the performance, the performance okay. okay, and the second one is larger competitor, something like that. Uh, okay. okay, thank you. And what is a larger competitor? Competitor. What is the the theoretical? Sorry, the operational variable for larger competitor. Like the the resources, maybe. No. Something that I can measure in the field. What is a larger competitor? Sorry? No. 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 The amount of resources that they use, the no. competitor? Plant B itself. No. No. Do you give up? Yeah. A shrub of plant B. A shrub of plant B. This shrub is a much larger competitor when we, co we, uh, when we compare with a seedling of plant A. What you are going to measure? Where are you going to place your sample, your plot to measure, to, to test this hypothesis? close to a shrub and far from a shrub. So the larger competitor is the shrub. Okay? This is the way you measure. Close to a larger competitor, can in, in your case, is plant B, and far from a larger competitor, which in this case is also plant B. So your larger competitor, the, the way you measure is placing your plots close to, to plant B, or far from plant B. <sighs> Method five. Predictions create a clear connection between your hypothesis and the methods. Let's come back a little bit. By looking at this table, do you have any idea how to proceed in the field? Are you experts in plant ecology? I'm not. But I can read this table and I can go to the field and have a very nice idea. I can screw the, the, the sample. Yes, of course. But now I have a very nice direction, okay? I need a shrub of plant B, okay? I need seedlings. Can I manipulate the seedlings instead of simply looking for seedlings in, uh, in the field? 
Can, can I place seedlings be, uh, below the, the, the shrub and far from the shrub? It's much more elegant. I love experiments. Okay, so I, I, I can take a, uh, a seedling, place it perhaps in, in, in a play, uh, whatever, plant it below the shrub and far from the shrub. And then I need to go there with in it, in a one month frequency. And each month I will measure the height of these plants. And with this measure, I can calculate growth rate. And I can go there 12 months in a row. And after one month, I will calculate the percentage of dead plants. And I also will have 12 samples of growth rate. And it's done. OK. Now, you have a, a word file called variables. And the idea here is to answer these questions uh, or to classificate the variables in uh, theoretical or um, operational. Here, I'm giving you 15 minutes, but let's try to do it in 10 minutes so we can correct this exercise before lunch so we have plenty of time uh, in the afternoon to explore other questions, okay? 10 minutes.
Chara. <coughs> okay. This is the same table you have, and what I'm going to do, I will show you if the variable here is theoretical or operational. And if the, the variable is theoretical, I will show here an example of an way to transform this theoretical variable into an operational variable. If this this the variable is operational, I'm going to show here in the example a way to what does this uh, operational variable can represent in theoretical terms. And I, I will use this color code to make things easier. Okay. So here, the one habitat disturbance is clearly theoretical. Can you imagine a, a unit, a measure? It, it is impossible. You are clearly talking about something that is theoretical. And now I'm going to show you uh, a way, an, an operational variable that can capture or can represent habitat disturbance annual frequency of fires okay so now we have reports every month about the number of fires in the amazon biome and this is a way to measure habitat disturbance in this kind of habitat okay fighting ability again is totally theoretical i cannot uh, put a unity, a measure in this variable. However, I can use an operational variable to measure this theoretical variable. And one of them is probability of winning a fight. Or if I am working in, in with UFC, Ultimate Fighting Championship, I can use perhaps the number of victories, vic victories of a, a given fighter in the champion, the championship. Distance between fragments. How can we measure distance? Meters, kilometers, whatever. So this is clearly something we can measure. So it's an operational variable. And distance between fragments can be a uh, representation of this theoretical variable, isolation of habitat patches. So I want to show uh, a measure distance between fragments and using this uh, variable, I am showing that habitats, pa uh, habitat patches are very far from each other or they are close to each other, okay? Mental health, well, this is a totally theoretical variable. So how much is your mental health? <laughs> this, is, this is question, it's nonsense, okay? <laughs> but we can translate it, this number of hospitalization per month and I'm just talking about hospitalization in a psychiatric uh, hospital, and I am not looking at one individual. I, I can look at the mental health, for instance, of the population of graduate students. And using a given university, if I measure the number of hospitalizations per month, I have a measure of mental health among uh, graduate students, okay? Uh, I have a question which is uh, just coming back a little bit. Is probability a measure? Because we usually measure the frequency of something, not the probability. So I was okay. thinking about this. This is uh, nice. We can change it for previous probability of winning a fight. So in, in, in previous fights, how many times this guy wanted so he is or not he is the, uh, the, 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 the favorite of, of the fight for instance when people are betting in some uh, fighter 
previously uh, to a fighter, the previous history uh, influence how much uh, they are going to pay you if this guy wins or not. If the, the guy is the favorite, you will, re you will receive not so many, much money. But if the guy is not, has not a very good history, but it, he guys wins the fight, you, and you, of course, if you put your money on him, you, you will receive a lot of money. So the, you can see this as a, the previous history and, okay. Okay, toxicity uh, is theoretical and we can measure toxicity in many different ways, okay? One of them is called LD, 50% of a substance. It's the concentration of a substance that uh, kills 50% of the individuals and LDs means little doses, okay? There are other ways. There are 535, 30, 37 ways of measuring toxicity, okay? Precisely. I'm joking. <laughs> Percentage of infected people. Operational, okay? Transmission risk of a disease is a possible uh, theoretical variable. Muscle mass. Operational. Mass. What is the muscle mass? Grams, kilograms, tons, whatever. I can use it as a measure of strength, a possibility. Survival probability, again, operational. And this, for instance, efficiency of crypsis, when the animal is disguised in, in the habitat, and I, I calculate survival probability in order to evaluate the efficiency of this defense mechanism. Structural complexity, totally theoretical and very hard to measure in, in nature. I'm going to put something here, but I, I don't believe it, okay? Density of vegetation, I, it's one of the possible measures, but whatever. Body mass index, and this is very easy. Every time it appears, an index is something that you measure, it transforms in something you can measure. Me, um, can calculate. So this is operational and can be nutritional state. We, have, uh, we measure this in babies in order to calculate if they are health, well uh, feeded, something like this. Uh, resource availability, clearly theoretical, okay? And you can measure it in many different ways, depending on what, what, what you want to measure. And here, suppose that I'm talking about lizards, and these lizards live uh, on the leaf litter of a forest. So now I can measure the mass of arthropods per uh, square meter. So this is a very easy way to calculate the resource availability for an animal group that feeds mostly on arthropods. Pluviosity, it's operational. We measure, what is the pluviosity of this place? place? Millimeters per year, okay? And it can be a measure of humidity, okay? So, please, if it's not okay, you can say, it's not, pro not a problem. Uh, I, I don't know if pluviosity is exactly what you define it now, but uh, maybe we could have other measures like uh, uh, how much time of the year is raining or not, for example. You have different, so p perhaps these other measures has received different names, okay? But all of okay. them you can measure. Okay, so pluviosity is a No, I, I, I don't know, I, I don't know, but what you said, you, you have a measure. Number okay. of whatever per month or numbers of day, all yeah, yeah, of I them mean, are... I mean, I, I interpreted pluviosity as a theoretical... Uh, okay, that can be represented variable. by other variables. Yeah, like uh, uh, how rainy a place is, is how I interpreted it. But, but at least in ecology, I don't know in other areas, perhaps climatology is different, but when you, you ask, what is the pluviosity of this place? We say a number of millimeters per year. So 
uh, uh, in the Amazon forest, for instance, the pluvios is about 2,500 millimeters a year. Okay. 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 So I use this this pluviosity to mid humidity, for instance. You can use it to measure other things. Uh, concentration of alkaloids. Concentrations is the quantity of something uh, per liter, per square meter, whatever. Uh, concentration, no, uh, uh, it's not, not meters, uh, in a volume. Uh, leaf palatability, for instance, uh, I want to measure if a, a leaf is palatable to a herbivore. So the more, the higher the concentration of an alkaloid, the less palatable this leaf will be to a herbivore. It's just an example. Sexual attractiveness. Theoretical or operational? Uh, welcome to my word. And how to measure this? <laughs> Sorry? Sorry? Number of sexual partners. Total number of copulations. Okay. The sexual partners implies that the, 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 the male and the female copulated. Okay approaches of a female it doesn't mean necessarily sexual attractiveness because when the the courtship starts if the female go, goes away this guy is not really sexually at attractive because the, the the sex need to be involved here so sorry Pre <coughs> rate of prey consumption rate prey consumption operational we are talking about number of prey per unit of time, okay? So here can be forage inefficient. If uh, uh, an species or an individual is highly efficient in, in foraging, the rate of prey consumption will be higher. Uh, oops, genetic variability, theoretical. And how can we measure? Is there any geneticist here? By SNPs. By SNPs? And you? Heterozygosity. Okay, heterozygosity. I, I, I'm using SNPs, okay? The number of SNPs, the uh, single nucleotide polymorphism. It is a way uh, using a screen of the entire genome to evaluate genetic variability. Irritability. Theoretical. And how can you measure this? <laughs> Sorry? Decibels. Decibels. How many times a person curses in, in one hour? <laughs> Number of bad words in a day. Whatever. Time between an stimulus and an answer, okay? It's a possibility. I'm some poke, something that, and the animal bites me, for instance. This is a measure of uh, irritability. Predation risk, theoretical, and I can, probability of being uh, attacked, okay? Per capita income. Okay, I, I can measure this, okay? And I can use it as a to operational variable to economic development, okay? I hope there is no, no one here working on economy because this is a very <laughs> polemic uh, subject. And density of conspecifics. Why is conspecifics? Okay. Oh, the, the same species, sorry. Density of conspecifics. See, I, I can measure. What's our density here? We count the number of us, assuming that all of us belong to the same species, and I measure the area, and I divide one uh, by another, okay? And this, to finish, what does density of can specific can represent in theoretical terms? Abundance, okay. But let's try to go more to the theory. 
Yeah, moleque. Competition intensity. Okay? When you go upstairs, or, up, or downstairs, I don't know, I don't remember, uh, and there is only one cake there, it's very clear that the density of conspecifics it will influence the number of slides you are going to have. Yes. Okay? <laughs> okay. It's one o'clock, lunch time, and I think we can stop now and we will come back uh, one thirty, right? Yes. So? Sorry? Two-thirds. Two-thirds. Okay. So we can eat a lot.